Welcome to the Bird Burger Podcast. Today, I'm honored to be joined here by Scott Walker, who is the name behind the YouTube channel Walks on the Wild Side and a teacher to many. Scott, what is the biggest thing that you've seen in your experience as a teacher that the common wildlife photography student might struggle in? Yeah, I think particularly through the people I take out in the field, the biggest thing would be understanding when there's the potential of a picture and when there isn't. Mm. You know, people will see the subject that they want to photograph and start snapping away, but it doesn't necessarily mean they've got the best angle mm. or the best background. And it's working the scene that you've got. Very often, just moving ever so slightly can make a tremendous difference, uh, whether yeah. that's with relation to the light or the subject itself, the background, what have you. But people just start snapping away. They're so eager. And I think you just have to take a breath sometimes. When subject turns up, just take 30 seconds to think about it. Sometimes not 30 seconds. That You don't always have that luxury. But take a moment to just give yourself a bit of breathing room, a bit of thinking room mm. about what you need to do to create the best picture you can and then start snapping away. Mm. Yeah, that's really good. I, I agree. I think the longer I've done wildlife photography, even personally speaking from a personal perspective, like I know exactly what you said where like for the first couple of years, I felt like it was like as soon as I'd see the the bird or the subject, it would just immediately pull up the camera, snap, 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 without yeah. giving it two thoughts about angles, lighting, background, foreground. And uh, that's a that's a really good one that you just mentioned. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I uh, recently did a video a couple of months back where I took people through the whole process. Uh, I was photographing a grey wagtail, and I actually only got two photographs of the bird in the whole session. Yeah. But through all the thinking that I did in terms of where I was going to position myself to give myself the best chance, which rocks on the river I wanted it to land on, and it did come to other rocks that just wouldn't have created nice photos, so I didn't mm. bother. The rocks that I wanted it to come to, it came to twice, but I spent a good couple of hours preparing for the photos so that when they came they were good and mm. i think that was a real revelation for people for some people <clears throat> i got a lot of comments and people contacting me, me via email and so on afterwards saying that they sort of never thought about it from that point of view and i think very often when you're new you don't think that way you just want to start snapping away and it really does take that thought to create something yeah yeah totally i love that that's really good so how long ago did you start doing wildlife photography and what's been the most difficult skill for you to master over these years of doing it? Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a really sort of gradual transition to wildlife photography. I started trying to take photography more seriously maybe 10 years ago. Um, and it wasn't wildlife at the time. I was photographing all sorts of things. Mm. And... Um, but I gradually fell in love with, well, nature in general, not just wildlife. Um, I photograph woodlands and landscapes and insects. I love insects. Yeah. Um, but it was a very gradual transition to that from photographing lots of general things. I used to do a lot of street photography, but I felt, mm. felt a little bit creepy out there doing that, you know, <laughs> walking around taking photos of random people doing interesting things. So <laughs> it was a very gradual transition. And uh, I think the most, the, the best thing that I learned very quickly was understanding that point about getting to usually the subject's eye level. Mm, because you yeah. point your camera up at trees, you don't get great photos. You point your camera down at the ground, you don't get great photos. And you're looking at all these wonderful photos of other people. Why aren't I doing that? Why can't mm. I get something like that? And not realizing that so much of it is because you're not at the right level. Yeah. So, you know, even if you're photographing birds in flight, get up on a hill, stand on a rooftop if you need to, but <laughs> get to their level because it's just so more compelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good news. Yeah, it's like that those, uh, you know, BBC Earth, National Geographic, where you see the guy climbing the jungle tree to get eye level with, you know, the osprey nest, maybe, you know, 100 yards out in the distance. And it's like that person probably could find some sort of angle if they're at the right spot from a little bit lower. But when you get that eye level engagement, it's just so good. And so I love that you shared that. Yeah. Well, in interestingly enough, I was on a trip a couple of weeks ago uh, that the place I turned up to photograph, the BBC camera crew were there making one of those films. <laughs> really? And I, yeah, I got talking to the camera guys, got a lot of tips from them. So, you know, anyone could learn anything at any point, can't they? But they've got I a lot of that. experience. Yeah. yeah, that's super cool. 
Yeah, so if you think of wildlife photography as kind of like a way of thinking, I can imagine many different ways that one gets into the hobby, right? Some people view it kind of as like an art form. Some people view it as a documentary, kind of like you were mentioning, um, where they're trying to create a story. Um, some people view it more as like a scientific method of gathering research and data. Um, some view it as just simply a way to be present and being kind of like one with nature and out in nature, uh, relaxing and taking in uh, the natural world. If you had to choose one from the list that I just mentioned or not on the list, how do you think of your wildlife photography and uh, why is that? Well, I'd like to think it's more at the artistic, artistic end of that kind of spectrum from pure documentary through to purely art. I think it's nearer mm. the art end. But documentary is important. You know, you can still create something beautiful, even if you're documenting something that a subject or a group of subjects even is doing. So I think that is important to think about, that it doesn't have to just be one or the other or somewhere in between. It mm. can be achieving a you know a multitude of things at once but yeah i tend to think that mine is more towards the artistic end of the spectrum at least that's what i aim for but i let yeah. other people judge that yeah <laughs> you'll let the people determine if it's worthy or not <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's good um yeah i yeah that is interesting a lot of times i guess um I probably fall into the trap of maybe thinking of it a little bit too black and white in those terms. And I love how you were just kind of like reminding me, probably reminding some viewers out there that you can find those middle grounds. You can find ways to incorporate both um, to where you kind of get the best of both worlds. So, Yeah, absolutely. Springtime, I see a lot of photos on Instagram and other platforms of people who found uh, parents feeding their chicks. Mm. Great. It's a great thing to photograph, but not every photo makes a great photo. Yep. You know, if you can find those right angles, those right situations, those clear backgrounds, those things that isolate the subject. Yep. So much better than just photographing the behavior on its own. So yeah, I think it is important to think about trying to achieve multiple things at once. So uh, you kind of already mentioned this, but you shoot a lot of different styles of nature photography, even beyond that, it sounds like in your past, but more right now, at least from what I know, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like you focus on different types of nature uh, yeah. photography. What are some of the key differences between like wildlife and macro, like you said, or maybe landscapes, or I know you shoot a lot of woodland and what type of person do you uh, kind of like envision diving into each of those different kind of uh, subgenres. Yeah, I, I actually don't see a whole heap of difference between them. Maybe the landscape stuff, the woodlands and, and more general landscapes are a little bit different, but the techniques that you use are different for sure. You know, mm. it's very rarely that I use a flash for my wildlife photography, but I'm using a flash almost all the time for my macro. Mm. So there are different techniques that you use, but I think the approach is the same. You know, mm. you're trying to get close to the subject without disturbing it. You're trying to photograph it in its natural environment. At mm. least for me, I know a lot of macro photographers do bring the insects into their home studios and things like that and photograph them indoors. But that's of no interest to me. I want to photograph them where they are. And you're trying to create something with what you can see in front of you. You know, what's the, what's the best background? What's the best foreground? Foreground blur, I think, is something mm. that people often overlook and it just adds so much dimension to the photo it, it makes it more 3d if you can see totally. something blurred leading up to the subject as well as getting that nice clear background i think that's something that people overlook but um i think it's the same for birds mammals insects whatever you're photographing it's the, it's the same approach really yeah um, it's just different techniques of how you achieve it mm. Yeah, you're, what I'm hearing you say is it's kind of a lot of the same mindset, even if some of the technicalities yeah. change, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, um, I love how you mentioned foreground too. That's definitely like one of the biggest things I constantly hammer home uh, with a lot of my students and uh, uh, try to just re uh, uh, remind and re-encourage them constantly. Look for your foreground angles and stuff like that. And I think especially when um, I like to tell people this a lot too, when they are... Um, maybe beginners or maybe they just don't have as big of a budget. Maybe they've been doing a long time, just don't have as much of a budget. But a lot of times um, 
with uh, lower end gear or lower budget gear, you know, when you can't get quite as shallow of a depth of field, you can cheat things and make things look a lot um, cleaner and smoother when you're able to incorporate different compositional elements like foreground to kind of give that effect of like, ooh, this is a really nice, clean, shallow depth of field. When in reality, it might be a, you know, 8.0, F11 uh, aperture. So, yeah. Yeah, well, to be honest, Jeremy, I shoot at those kind of mid-range apertures all the time anyway. It's very rare mm. that I go wide open. Mm. Um, and I know a lot of people teach shoot wide open, but I stick with, I may be in the F8 to F13 range all the mm. time. And I'm st still trying to get those clear backgrounds through choosing the right situations, mm. you know, choosing an appropriate background distance from the subject and things like that. Because I just love the details that you get with those mm. mid-range apertures. So often you'll be shooting wide open and you get the bird's eye, maybe it's beak in focus, and then it drifts out of focus towards the tail. And I want to get the whole subject, mm. you know, sharp and in focus if I can. So I do tend to shoot at mid-range apertures a lot. I talk about that quite a lot on the channel. It often surprises people yeah. when they see that I've got a nice clear background. It's quite soft, but it was at F13. So for you, because, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty... Um, I wouldn't say controversial because there's nothing, you know, polarized about it, but it's it's uh, it's not like you said, it's not the way that most people often recommend. So for you, you're kind of viewing it in your mind as even though you're sacrificing maybe a little bit of that shallow depth of field and a little bit of that more blurred background or more blurred foreground for you, the sacrifice is worth it to get that uh, subject more more of the subject in focus is what you're saying. Yeah, totally. Uh, absolutely. And I think Sometimes people rely on shooting wide open as it's a bit of a crutch for them. Mm. You know, you've got to be hmm. wide open to get something nice and you don't have to be at all. And particularly if you've got lower end gear, mm. you know, you haven't got the luxury of being at F4 or F2.8 or anything like that. You're probably likely to be starting, you know, at F5.6, if not, mm. you know, even shallower. So... I'm trying to show people that you can still create things by choosing the right situation to be in, by yeah. choosing the right background, and also by getting close enough to the subject. The, the closer you can be, the better that ratio of the distance from you to the subject and subject to the background. Mm -hmm. So by being in a situation where, you know, using your field craft, you can get really close to the subject... You can create something that looks like it might be F4, even if you know you're at F11 or something like that. So I think it's a it is an important lesson for people that you don't have to be shooting wide open all the time. And in fact, I prefer it. But also, I think one of the reasons that I prefer it is I tend to like backgrounds that give some context. Mm -hmm. You know, they are soft, they are defocused backgrounds. But if you can see a little bit of the river that the bird is on, or the trees it just gives a little bit more and it, again i think that's a, a point of difference some people like those really clear backgrounds where there's just sky and nothing else behind the subject for me they just feel a bit clinical you know mm. it feels like you could have taken a bird and photographed it in a studio mm. so i want to make the photos feel quite natural and i like to incorporate a lot of background into my photos all the time and being at those wider apertures sorry being at those narrower apertures really helps to do that so i think a lot of it depends upon your kind of artistic interpretation of what you want to get out of the situation and get out of the photo you know if you're aiming for that really clear background that's maybe just sky or some very uh very blurred out leaves something like that shooting wide open is great absolutely mm. but if you're wanting to give your subject that little bit more context mid-range ap mid apertures is the way to go mm. for me yeah yeah would you say there's something to be said about also, I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the majority of your wildlife photography is done at pretty, um, obviously tight angles, technically when it comes to the gear, but it's also, um, pretty tightly composed as, um, I wouldn't say all like, you know, not all your shots are portraits, but they're leaning towards that portrait end. And when you're towards that portrait end, it's then, uh, it's more important if you're wanting to include that context to bring that you know, the f-stop up versus I don't feel like, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't feel like I see as many of your images that are super wide. So you're trying to get as shallow as you can with your uh, aperture. That way you, you know, get even more blur. Is there something to be said about that in terms of stylistically how you shoot and in combination with that? Or 
Yeah, or am I just missing it there? <laughs> no, no, I, I think I think you're right. And certainly over the last few years, I've really tried to compose in the heat of the moment. Mm. So I kind of feel a bit gutted now if I end up having to crop a photo. Mm. Um, and it's not that there's anything wrong with cropping photos. It, sometimes it has to be done. But if I can get it right there and then in the heat of the moment in camera, I just feel so much better about it because I've got a good idea of how the finished image is going to end up and actually for me this is a, a a talking point perhaps it worries me slightly that everybody has got these super high megapixel you know 60 mm. megapixel cameras and stuff now because they don't need to get as close to the subject but mm. what they are sacrificing by being further away is that ratio of the distance from you to the subject and the subject to the background and you do end up with... I've seen so many photos that have been shot on 60 megapixel cameras and people have cropped in and the background looks awful. Yeah, and yeah. So I, I think it's great having these, this fantastic kit that allows you to make massive pictures. But if you rely on that to crop in, mm. you are sacrificing the background. And I still shoot with 24 yeah. megapixel camera. It's perfectly fine for me. Um but it does mean that I try even harder to compose there and then on the spot as I'm doing it so that I don't have to rely on cropping. Further, I've gotten in my career as well, the more that I've become okay with less and less megapixels in my career. I think there's still a point where like, I don't really like to get under that 24 limit because then I feel like I'm losing the ability to crop when I really, really need it, even just a little bit of crop, not a ton. Um, but I really like that like 24 to 32 range now a lot more than I used to at, at like, you know, a couple of years ago, maybe even two, three years ago, I really thought like, man, 50, 50 megapixels is the way to go. Um, but the more that I'm kind of understanding just technicalities and how, uh, how composition works, the less I realize I need so many extra ones. And the more I actually want the, the better noise control of those slightly lower megapixel cameras, you know? So uh, yeah. I, I definitely agree with you on there. So that's good. So as simple as we can make it sound sometimes, I feel like for many, it can be hard to get the motivation to go out and do wildlife photography. How do you kind of deal with this struggle yourself and what would be your best advice for it? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting topic. And I mentioned in a video some time back that I struggle to get out on overcast days, mm. which is such a shame because overcast days are perfect for bird photography i really think yeah uh, slightly overcast not not too too overcast but slightly overcast days but i look out the window and i just don't feel like going out i think <laughs> it's me i need the sunshine mm. um and i i do often shoot in bright sunny conditions less than ideal mm. but i'm in the right mindset i've got you know i'm in the right gear to go and do it interesting and i think it's such an important part of it because if if you're not inspired, if you're not feeling motivated, you're not going to turn up with anything good. And I certainly feel the more I go on with this, that I need to be in the right kind of headspace for it. Mm. If, if, if not, if I'm going out there and forcing myself to do photography when I don't want to do photography, I just end up going through the motions. Hmm. And it's the same old, same old thing that there's nothing interesting that comes from it. Hmm. The interesting things come for me when I've got challenging conditions there's that horrible light how am i going to work this and create something good hmm. or it's tipping down of rain you know what can i do to still get photos in this kind of situation interesting they're the situations that i really love but those overcast days i struggle to get out if i open the curtains and it's looking a bit overcast i just want to go back to bed hmm. but something else that i found for me that's really helpful as well is being at the location that i want to be so I've tried more and more to travel to places the night before because mm. if I'm already there, I might as well get up and do it. Yeah. But if I'm at home and I get up and I'm not feeling like it, I'll just go back to bed. Yeah. And so I, I find, you know, particularly if I'm traveling some distance to go and do something, get there the night before, be there, and then I've kind of forced myself to get <laughs> up and do it. But I know not everybody has that luxury. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you're right. I I uh, can relate to your second point quite a lot in the way of like, uh, I can get, uh, <clears throat> for better or worse, right? I can get kind of uh, bored of doing the same location time and time again, same subjects time and time again. Um, so I've, I've found over the years that I really 
value kind of like doing intensives is kind of like how I would see it of like, I don't mind if I don't do wildlife photography for three weeks in a row. And then on the fourth week, I'll go out to some location, you know, nearby, stay a night or two, camp out there and, uh, and just go all three mornings back to back, like all day long, just keep going for it. And that's where I find a lot of like the excitement for me and my adrenaline's going. I'm really creative in those moments. I'm finding new angles, finding new things. And, um, that's kind of the flow that I've found works the best for me. Um, the downside to, to that is that like sometimes I don't know the subjects in that specific spot as well as I should, right? So maybe I am missing some things. Just like you said on your overcast days, you're probably missing some really good opportunities, right? But yeah. at the end of the day, um, you're right. There's something to be said about mindset being possibly even more important than scenario. And uh, at least in the long run, having the motivation to keep going is is definitely important rather than constantly maybe just forcing yourself to do something and yeah. becoming bitter over time. So, yeah. Yeah, there's nothing worse than forcing yourself to do something because one, you lose the joy of it anyway. Mm. And you know, let's, let's face it, we're, we're all doing this for the enjoyment of it. Mm. It's not like somebody's cracking the whip and forcing us to type away at that computer or whatever. <laughs> we're doing, whether it's, you know, something that you're earning money from or you're doing it in your pot, in your spare time, we're all doing it for the love of photography. And if you're forcing yourself to go out there and do it when you don't really want to, you lose the joy of it. Yeah. So go when you're motivated. That's what I say. Yeah, I love that. That's good. So you started your YouTube journey three years ago. Uh, what inspired you to start up YouTube then? Well, yeah, I I had planned to have a sort of a business based around photography. Mm -hmm. And where I'd been working at the time, I, you know, I'd been having people say, well, can you help us with our photography? Um, and so I'd taken colleagues and stuff out and given them lessons and things and I, I kind of gradually came to the realization that if I was going to have some kind of career in it, if I was going to have some kind of paid result from working in photography, it needed to come from teaching people. Mm. Because I think that's one where my strengths are. Mm. You know, yeah. lots of lots of people create YouTube videos that really are a different genres. They're they're yep. all based around photography, but they're different different genres of videos. You know, there are certain people who vlog. You know, take take you along on the journey with them there are certain people who are storytellers you know tron westby great storyteller very visual stuff you know great videos you've got other people uh one of the most different ones i can think of gavin hardcastle i love his videos hmm. his is an entertainment channel that's based around photography mine is an education channel that's based around photography hmm. we're doing two different genres of video but based on the same subject matter so getting back to your question, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of realized that somehow my business needed to be about teaching people photography mm. and YouTube just seemed like the ideal place to be, you know, whether it's to get a bit of self-promotion and get your name out there or whether it's to try and make money through YouTube. I, I honestly think it's the best platform there is for photography just because of the easily accessibility of it anybody can watch those videos anybody can create those videos you know it doesn't take a special skill you can start out from anywhere and i think the community is great on here you know i see a lot of the nastiness that happens on some other platforms that i don't enjoy and that's why i don't <laughs> participate in them yeah but generally the people on youtube are people who want to either consume photography or learn photography and the people are great and that's why i love youtube so you know, YouTube has been an important part of what I've been doing over the last few years, for sure. So you mentioned uh, a, a lot of the goal initially even was to build a business and build a uh, maybe possibly a, a full time career in the future or at least a part time career. Um, so what are your career goals with wildlife photography then uh, in the long run or maybe short term as well? And how do you kind of plan to keep pursuing them? I know you're mentioning already teaching, but any more kind of specific ways that you're trying to approach that or anything that you'd be willing to share yeah well before the pandemic i'd been doing a few few lessons and workshops and things like that for people and then i took a break from everything during the pandemic it was just for me it was just the wrong time to be mm. out there trying to uh build a business when you can't really leave your home you're not supposed to be traveling and so on so i just took a break from youtube and everything for that that period and then really got back into it and 
the lessons uh, and the workshops have picked up. I particularly enjoy doing the lessons when you one on one with somebody, or maybe mm. one on two. Sometimes you get a couple that comes out. It's very often, you know, a husband and wife or whatever who come together, and those are great because you really get to invest in the person and you can tailor the 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 teaching the the, the session around their needs so you know some people come along and they're just like just get me in a position where i can photograph this subject i know what i'm doing (laughs) with the photography but i can't find this thing so that that's easy but then there are other people who want to learn different aspects of it quite a few people ask about the kind of field craft skills and approaching subjects getting close to subjects and and things like that and that's just a joy you know when you can help somebody with that lit that final hurdle mm. you know they've probably got 90 percent of what they need already you just need to give them that extra 10 percent. i yeah. get a lot of satisfaction from that i love that that's good um so what are uh what are the next things for your wildlife photography on youtube do you have any kind of uh new types of content that you're trying to pursue or maybe possibly thinking about pursuing or any new ways of doing things yeah, I well, next year for sure, I have planned a couple of different projects that I want to do that are about photographing particular subjects on a more long-term basis. Mm. So rather than just spending a day or two photographing something and then move on to the next type of subject, I want to spend more time, maybe every single week of the year, mm. trying to photograph a couple of different subjects in the same way. Wow. Now, the problem will be that on YouTube, that will mean people won't see that content until 2025. Yeah. But for me, I think there's a couple of things about that. One, I think it's important for some of the more advanced people to start thinking about doing things like photo projects where you focus on particular subjects and really excel at them. And I... I the example I would give is is Mark Smith. You know, he brilliant photographer, but he's almost exclusively oh, uh, photographic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. You know, you might get the odd pelican shot or something like that, but almost exclusively. And there's so much to be said for knowing the subject that well. Mm. So that's part of what I want to achieve. It's about getting to know the subject. But I think a kind of personal satisfaction for me as well that I want to see that subject throughout the seasons and you know mm. hopefully we get some snow we haven't really had anywhere i live for the last couple of years um but ho- hopefully we get some proper seasons next year where i can photograph these subjects in a variety of of conditions mm. so yeah. i'm quite excited about doing that um but as i say unfortunately my viewers aren't going to see that until maybe 2025 if it comes off but i have also got plans perhaps i'm maybe 80 percent of the way there so i'm letting you into a kind of secret before it's ready to go out there jeremy uh-huh uh, but i i'm thinking of creating a second channel mm. uh, for next year yeah that's about an aspect of nature that i've never photographed before hmm. and it will be again it would be a different genre of photography instead of me teaching it it's about me learning it and you coming on the journey with hmm. me and you know maybe other people who want to learn that kind of thing will follow along Uh, maybe there'll be experienced people who want to give me tips which will be great Mm. but um yeah i think if i do it and i'm maybe 80 percent of the way there in my planning um it'll be a very different type of channel Hmm. and it it won't i won't take anything away from walks on the wild side that will still be there this is stuff i can do around that i love that that's really interesting i love that and i feel like that's actually really missing in our space um in kind of the nature photography realm i don't uh, yeah you said it was going to be nature photography but a different subgenre correct yeah Um, yeah well i'll let you into the secret astro i've never done astro mm, yeah i mean obviously i've taken photos of the moon and i've incorporated the moon into landscape photos that i've done but i really want to learn astro so uh, my plan is i'm going to go out there and learn it but take people on the journey with me yeah fingers crossed yeah fingers crossed yeah yeah, yeah, I love I, that. I, I might, if I end up not doing it, you might have to cut this out of the video. <laughs> yeah, but. we'll just we'll just put a big over a uh, big old skip over this whole section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I love that though because I feel like um, in our in our uh, wildlife photography genre specifically. So I'm assuming you know a lot of your initial audience will probably be a lot of wildlife photographers that transfer over, hopefully. Um, but I think that that's so cool in the way of like. Um, for some reason, I feel like in this wildlife photography genre, sometimes the people who are the most public facing, um, and I'm probably guilty of this myself, so I'm not trying to even just put the blame on everyone else, but for some reason, I feel like there's a big stigma of like, you have to have it all together. And so you see a lot of, um, 
a lot, I feel like it can be discouraging in the way of like, you see a lot of people that kind of act like they have it all together and they have nothing to learn. And that's discouraging as a viewer, kind of like walking into a space like that and feeling intimidated maybe. And it's also, I think really, uh, it puts a lot of, uh, we need to be a lot more responsible, I think as well as uh, creators ourselves to like show those parts of us that aren't, you know, all the way there yet and are learning and, um, you know, are constantly learning things from people who may, may have more experience than us, maybe better than us, may have a different eye than us. It's not even always about being better or worse. It just might be about having a different creative eye. Right. And so there's people that I know that there's like styles that they're better at than me. And so I'm constantly like trying to pull things from them uh, and stuff like that. So I think it's really cool that you are starting a whole channel that people who know you as the teacher now get to see you as a student. So that's a really yeah. cool idea. And I think you absolutely hit the nail on the head about people understanding that we're all learning as well. Yeah. You know, nobody's 100% that. I, I spent a lot of time reading about photographers who are absolutely at the top of their fields. So I'm not talking about people like me. I'm talking about the absolute top guys, you know, the, the, the ones who have done this professionally for many, many years. They're paid by the top publications, you know, the, yeah. the, the top 0.001% yeah. that yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> and they're, they're all always learning. Yep. Whether, whether it's learning about a new subject, a new way to do things, everyone Mm. everyone is always learning yeah. and I, I certainly i'm always learning and I, th I think you make a really good point that sometimes that doesn't doesn't come across and so, certainly the last couple of weeks has been a big learning curve for me mm. i haven't put any content out for a couple of weeks because i've been busy trying to recondition myself to change the way i do photography because mm. I, i've developed a bit of a problem in my right eye which is a shame because that's the eye that's always up against the eyepiece oh wow and yeah. um it's nothing major it's, but i'm gonna have to wear uh, glasses for reading but i have a slightly different i've got two problems one i'm gonna need to wear glasses for reading but i've also got a problem seeing things at distances and i, mm. I noticed when picking up the sort of food packets and you read the small print and i'm kind of having to do this kind of thing to mm. to, to read it properly and focus on it so i went to the optician and he, he said to me that the problem with seeing things at a distance is probably being caused by the fact that you've got your eye up against the eyepiece mm. all the time. You know, you're focusing on a really tiny little screen inside mm. that eyepiece. And he said, you, you really need to switch eyes and put your left eye up against the eyepiece. Mm. And I'm like, is that even possible? <laughs> I had to really is that think a thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how can you do that? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Honestly, it sounds like the smallest thing switching from this eye to this eye, but it has oh, completely thrown I me. I believe it. Because my hands, where you know, I know where all the buttons are. I don't need to take my hands away from. Uh, I don't need to take my eye away from the camera to twist a dial or press a button. I know where they all are. Mm. But now it's over here. I feel like I'm lost. Yeah. I feel like I don't know my camera anymore, and I've got to get to know it again. You know, it might have only shifted <laughs> three centimeters, but I am lost. So yeah. I've spent the last couple of weeks trying to recondition myself. Yeah. Now, it, you know, it's only a small thing, but again, you're always learning. It, it reminded me of last time I changed my camera gear. You go through a learning curve all the time. You're getting to know that new gear again. So mm. whatever the situation is, whether you're learning a new subject or, or trying to change something about the way that you do things, mm. we're all always learning. And I think you're probably right, Jeremy. We, we should take some responsibility for maybe saying that a bit more yeah yeah that's good yeah i can imagine how difficult that is and even like button placement like you're saying but even just like i feel like you're so probably so in tune with like tracking out of your right eye looking through the viewfinder and being able to track that bird in flight for example yeah. but then when you move it over to your left eye you're kind of like in a different position and so you're like how do i how do i track this bird correctly and you don't know the kind of the speeds to move at and yeah i can imagine that's a yeah. challenge Totally. Well, I, I always say to people that it's like muscle memory. You know, yep. wh when, whether you play golf or kick a football or whatever, you know, that swing for your golf, that, that becomes muscle memory. Yep. Your, your body just does it without you having to think about it. Whereas when you start off playing, you really have to think about your swing. Yeah. And it's the same with photography. You, you really have to think, you know, where's that button where I can quickly change the white balance or whatever. Yep. And um, you, it becomes second nature to you. It becomes muscle memory, but also those movements. You know, so much of the motion of your body is transmitted to the camera. Yep. And so it becomes muscle memory as you're panning, tracking a subject as it's flying across the sky. 
and just taking the balance of things, you know, moving the camera slightly over to this side has meant I'm off balance. Yep. You know, I'm not as steady at tracking the subject totally. as I was when I was using my right eye. So, you know, there's a lot to think about, but I, I think it's another important lesson for new starters to understand that sometimes these things seem impossible. Tracking a bird across the sky and not letting it go outside the frame seemed impossible to hmm. me when I was starting out. But through practice and muscle memory, it just becomes second nature. So yeah. the more you do it, the more you practice, the more you get out there, the easier it becomes. And uh, I think that's something that also perhaps doesn't get said often enough. Mm. You know, people focus so heavily on the gear and have I, you know, got a camera that's got enough frames per second to get that bird in flight and all that stuff. And people don't necessarily focus on what they're doing, how they're using their bodies. And mm. that's so, so important. Yeah. That might have been one of my favorite videos I've ever watched of yours, actually, was talking about body positioning uh, in the sense of, like, being one of my favorite in the sense of, like, uh, just new information for me, um, even. Like, some of those things I knew, but subconsciously, and now it's like putting words to it, or some things I, I had never thought of before. And so that was a really good video. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, thank you. It's good to hear that. Yeah. Um, so as I always ask everyone that I like to interview, um, what is the single most important thing if you had to pick one, uh, to doing wildlife photography? Well, oh, wow. Yeah. I should have prepared for that. Um, <laughs> single most important thing I, I think is the thing that's become most important to me over the years is being prepared. So mm. I think we all start out from a point of view of wandering around and photographing whatever we see. Yeah. And you don't get your best photos typically in those situations. Sometimes you can get an amazing shot by chance. Yeah. But typically you get your best photos when you're prepared. And I love nothing more than going to where I know I can see a subject and finding the perfect position for me to photograph that subject. Sometimes I even know right down to which branch I want to photograph the subject on or mm. which rock in the river, as I yep. described before, and being prepared for the situation. And some days you get lucky. You might end up with 30 photos of that subject in the right position. Sometimes it might just be one or two. Sometimes it's not any. Yep. But preparedness has probably become the key for me. Um, and putting that level of forethought into your planning for your trips, planning for your your sessions that you do out in the field. And certainly as I've started to teach photography more one-on-one -on -one with people, I'm now having to think about how I can get two, sometimes three people into those positions. You know, mm. it's all right saying I'm going to lie on this particular bank of a river, but now where am I going to find the space for three people to do it? So mm. I'm having to prepare for not just me, for other people. Yep. Um, and it, it's brought home to me just how important that being prepared is mm. uh, for my photography, certainly. Yeah, I love that. That's really good. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's, it's a, uh... It's, it's, I would agree. It's rare that you get so many, uh, good images if you're not prepared. Um, I know one of the reasons why like you, uh, help judge the photo competition, right? And Nathan Watson is just incredibly talented photographer. And I know one of the big reasons why he is so good at getting good shots is because he's very good at knowing his situations and being prepared for them. So it's a great example yeah. of that. So yeah, I love that yeah. you shared that. Well, thank you for coming on. It was great getting to talk with you and uh, getting to hear yeah, some of your you perspectives. Too. So, Thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, most definitely. Thank you all for watching. If you want to see more from Scott Walker, make sure to check out his YouTube channel linked in the description below. And if you want to see more interviews with other creators like this one, check out this video here in the end screen.